I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare, Series 2, Podcast Q, Richard II. The two bodies of the king, body personal and body politic, were discussed in Session 2 of Chapter 7 in Series 1. In Richard II, Shakespeare conveys an additional pair of qualities that ought to belong to a king, namely right and merit. A king rules by right only when he has inherited the throne legitimately from his predecessor, usually his father. That is true even in a state like Denmark, where the king must be chosen from the royal family by electors. In Hamlet, Claudius has forfeited his right to rule because he wrongly murdered his brother in order to become king. That being the case, Hamlet is the only legitimate heir to the throne. Illegitimacy of rule in a king implies both an immoral monarch and a precarious state. But even a king who rules by right must also have merit. That is, he must have the abilities, the character, and the judgment to be a good king. Only thereby can he fulfill his function as the embodiment of the state. Selfishness, illegality, pride, abuse of power, these can turn even a rightful king into a tyrant. In Richard II, Shakespeare depicts the deposing of one king by another. The first, Richard, is the rightful king. He is the direct and legitimate heir of his grandfather, Edward III, whose eldest son, Edward the Black Prince, Richard's father, had already died. However, Richard is a self-indulgent, unjust, and at times tyrannical man, using his position for his own gain and pleasure at the cost of his realm and his subjects. In the middle of the play, he is deposed, forced to renounce the crown and leave his office by Henry Bolingbroke, sometimes spelled Bolingbroke, son of the Duke of Lancaster, and a very competent, responsible, careful man, whose aim is to put England back on a solid footing. Should Richard die without an heir, Henry would be the next male in line for the throne, by descent through the male line. And England needs just such a competent and responsible king. However, Henry's right to the throne is questionable, not only because Richard is alive, but also because, by descent through the female, the next in line would be Edmund Mortimer, the great-grandson of Lionel, Duke of Clarence, through his daughter Philippa, whom Richard himself recognized as heir presumptive. Because, under the doctrine of the two bodies of the king, England and the king of England are one, John of Gaunt is right to observe at Act 2, Scene 1, lines 65 to 66, that under Richard, that England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Richard has abandoned royal duties in favor of personal self-indulgence, which he imagines his inherited right is sufficient to justify. Thus, splitting right from merit and the natural man from the royal within himself, Richard splits apart England. His fall is the fall of England into nearly a century of civil war. The unfolding of the plot presents us with this tragic agony of England, moving from the government of a bad but rightful king to that of a good king whose legitimacy is in question. And this motion is embodied in the structure of the play by an expansion of the figure of speech called chiasmus, from the Greek letter chi, which is shaped like an X. It is the ABBA, or mirror image structure of a line of verse. Here are some examples. Some rise by sin, and some by virtue fall. That's measure for measure, Act 2, Scene 1, Line 38. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action. That's Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 2, Line 17 to 18. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. That's Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 1, Line 11. 
The structure of the whole play, Richard II, is a chiasmus of the plot. Richard, right, falls as Henry, merit, rises. This will be reversed at the play's end, when Richard briefly rises in merit, and Henry's right is challenged by rebellion in the kingdom. In addition, in Act 4, Scene 1, lines 200-202, at the very moment when Richard hands the crown to Henry, and they are both holding it as it passes from the one to the other, Richard speaks a verbal chiasmus that is the turning point of the play. Bolingbroke Are you contented to resign the crown? Richard I No No I For I must nothing be Therefore no no For I resign to thee I know no I Spelled A Y N O N O A Y has several levels of meaning, but the fundamental one is yes, no, no, yes. It can also be heard as capital I, K N O W, N O, capital I, I do not know myself, and also capital I, K N O W, N O, A Y. I do not know any way of saying yes. Therefore, no, no, means, since I know no capital I, do not know myself, I cannot even answer no, N-O, because I have resigned and am in no position to say no to your question. With this chiasmus, the crown and the government of England shift from the rightful Richard to the meritorious Henry, the verbal chiasmus articulates the historical. Because the distribution of the two qualities of right and merit is split between the two kings, the other characters in the play face a quandary. To which king are they duty-bound to be loyal? The rightful king or the competent one? And when? At the extremes, the Earl of Northumberland is one of the first to turn against Richard in favor of Henry. The Bishop of Carlisle, his opposite, publicly denounces Bolingbroke for deposing Richard. Inside the imaginary brackets of those two, Omeral, York's son, remains loyal to Richard too long and only rushes across to Henry at the last moment, saved by his mother and Henry's mercy from punishment for treason. One of the great portrayals in the play is that of Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, the uncle of both Richard and Henry, being the younger brother of Richard's father, Edward the Black Prince, and of Henry's father, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. He begins in loyalty to the rightful nephew, Richard, but slowly moves through neutrality toward loyalty to the meritorious nephew, Henry. Shakespeare portrays these characters as a spectrum of loyalties to convey the dilemma into which England is thrown by the splitting of merit from right in Richard, which calls forth the answering split of right from merit in Henry. The shift from Richard to Henry is associated with the historical movement from medieval to Renaissance concepts of kingship and the downward trajectory of history. The play begins in medieval-style ceremony and ends in Renaissance-style practical politics. Early in the play, Richard sets up an old-fashioned medieval trial by combat between the opponents, Bolingbroke and Mowbray, whose conflict arises from contrary claims of loyalty and betrayal, Act 1, Scenes 1 and 3. That conflict remains unsettled when Richard prevents its resolution and erupts again in the beginning of Act 4, Scene 1. At the end of the play, Henry is threatened by rebellions and strives to consolidate his rule through force, abetted by the practical but unwelcome murder of Richard by Sir Pierce of Exton, Act 5, Scenes 4 and 6. Richard rests on right, and his doing so is represented by the formalities of Act 1, 
scenes 1 and 3. Henry rests on merit, and the practical concerns of establishing his rule and the peace of England are represented by the throne room deliberations and planning of Act 5, scenes 3 and 6. This movement from medieval to Renaissance political action is associated with the clash of two concepts of kingship. Does the king have absolute rule by divine right, or is he limited by feudal law, custom, and contract? Under the influence of the former idea, Richard believes he can do anything he wants, and so appropriates the lands and wealth of Lancaster after the death of John of Gaunt. Under the influence of the latter idea, Bolingbroke believes that peers of the realm are entitled to their inheritance by the same laws and customs that justify the royal inheritance of kings, and so claims his rights to Lancaster. The shift from Richard to Henry also illustrates Shakespeare's awareness of the historical changes from what C.S. Lewis called the medieval synthesis to the disintegrations of the Renaissance brought on by the Reformation, the religious wars, Machiavelli, and Bacon's new science, which I discussed under the title of Disintegrating Forces in Session 4 of Chapter 7 in Series 1. Shakespeare's treatment of these changes illustrates the Renaissance idea that universal human history constitutes a decline from the initial perfection of the created world, imaged as the Garden of Eden in the Bible and as the Golden Age by the ancient Greeks, toward the final dissolution of the world imagined in line 12 of Shakespeare's Sonnet 55, that wear this world out to the ending doom. The play's governing structure of chiasmic rise and fall is embodied in little in Act 3, Scene 3, when Richard returns to England from his Irish war and Henry is gathering forces against him and executing Richard's corrupting sycophants. Here, Richard alternates between joy and despair as his followers alternately attempt to cheer him and then announce that yet another of his forces has abandoned him for Henry. Richard's moments of joy are characterized by a self-indulgent and egotistical sentimentality of right. Richard imagines that his followers, his name, the natural world, angels, and God will fight for him against Henry, despite his own utter failure to govern properly or to take any responsibility for his predicament, merely because he is the rightful king. He likens himself to the sun and imagines that his mere appearance, like the sun driving thieves into hiding, will scatter Henry's forces. He imagines that Henry's armies will be defeated by the earth of England, its spiders and toads, nettles and snakes, merely because he, Richard, rules by right. Lines 10 to 26, 36 to 62, 83 to 90, 188 to 193. To this list of supposed defenders, Richard later adds divine armies of pestilence, lines 85 to 90. Interrupting these fantasies are the reports that one force after another has gone over to Henry. These reports drive Richard into intermittent bouts of despair, lines 76 to 81, 93 to 103, 144 to 177, and 204 to 214. The alternating rise and fall of Richard's emotions exemplify the larger pattern of rising and falling that is tied to the chiasmic structure of the play. Richard falls as Henry rises. Wright falls as Merritt rises. At the end, as we shall see, Richard's body falls as his soul rises. Written in the same period as Romeo and Juliet and A Midsummer Night's Dream, Richard II, like them, is dense with figures of speech in a highly wrought poetic style used to convey complexities of idea, emotion, and character, or, as Aristotle would put it, logos, pathos, and ethos. Because of this style of his verse, 
some critics have characterized Richard as a poet. This misses the point. The poetry of Richard's alternations between his self-serving claims to metaphysical right and his self-serving renunciations depicts Richard as essentially a sentimentalist, that is, one who worships his own emotional states rather than subduing them in the name of reason and of the good government of himself and of England. Shakespeare makes Richard's poetic imagery convey not aesthetic gifts, but sentimentality, a form of moral blindness. Richard entertains himself with his own imagery of himself as king, as if the fact of being the rightful king were sufficient when what is called for from a king is also effective and just government. John of Gaunt's criticism of Richard's rule, spoken in Act 2, Scene 1, Lines 100 to 103, is accurate. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet, encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Richard is a flatterer of himself, as if the fact of being the rightful king could relieve him of the duty to govern England rightly. And if England's king is corrupted, England is corrupted. Richard's sentimental self-worship and the consequent failure to take responsibility for his kingdom is illustrated in the conversation of the gardener in Act 3, Scene 4, which I discussed in Session 2 of Chapter 6 on Unity in Variety in Series 1. As an example of how Shakespeare can use such small scenes unrelated to the main plot to contribute to the unity of theme. In that scene, the metaphor of trimming and pruning a garden illustrates what is happening to England, which Gaunt, at Act 2, Scene 1, Line 42, has called this other Eden. Demi Paradise. Richard's moral failure is dramatized one final time in the depiction of its opposite, not now the opposite represented by Henry's practicality, but the opposite contained in Richard's first and only moral success, his own moral transformation in prison at the end of the play. In his great soliloquy in Act 5, Scene 5, Lines 1 to 94, Richard confronted with the inevitable fact of his failure, is at last moved to take responsibility. Once again, there is a series of rising and falling. Sometimes am I king, then treasons make me wish myself a beggar, and so I am. Then crushing penury persuades me I was better when a king. Then am I kinged again, and by and by think that I am unkinged by Bullenbrook, and straight am nothing. Lines 32 to 38. He concludes that he will never be eased with having nothing until he is nothing. Lines 38 to 41. Another example of his self-indulgence in despair. But then a significant breakthrough occurs. Someone from outside the prison tries to comfort Richard with music the symbol of the moral, spiritual, and structural harmony built into God's creation and longed for within the fallen and therefore conflicted self. But the music is played badly, out of time. It thus becomes, like the garden in Act 3, Scene 4, a symbol of Richard's life. How sour sweet music is when time is broke and no proportion kept so is it in the music of men's lives. And here have I the daintiness of ear to check time broke in a disordered string, but for the concord of my state and time had not an ear to hear my true time broke. I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. Lines 42 to 49 that last line is yet another chiasmus, revealing the birth of self-knowledge in Richard. The music itself is a gift, but the more significant gift is that it is played badly, a metaphor for Richard's bad government, 
of which his imprisonment is the consequence. Only suffering could bring Richard to see in himself the truth of Gaunt's critique of him in Act Two, Scene One. In response to this suffering, Richard rises to the occasion of his imprisonment and, with the help of the badly played music, realizes the truth of his life, his failure to merit what he was given by right. This breakthrough in Richard's knowledge of himself then leads to a moral breakthrough, a turning of his will. This music mads me, let it sound no more. For though it have hope madmen to their wits, in me, it seems, it will make wise men mad. Yet blessing on his heart that gives it me, for tis a sign of love, and love to Richard is a strange brooch in this all-hating world. Lines 61 to 66. For the first time in his life, Richard has considered the good intention of another human being, and in gratitude has uttered a blessing on someone other than himself. For once, thanks to his recognition of his own responsibility, he is able to set aside his own ego and to bless the intention of the giver of even badly played music. He regresses to habit for a moment in blaming his horse for not stumbling when Henry was on his back, but then immediately says, Forgiveness, horse, why do I rail on thee, since thou, created to be awed by man, wast born to bear? I was not made a horse, and yet I bear a burden like an ass, spurred, galled, and tired by jouncing Bullenbrook. Lines 90 to 94. And then, when the jailkeeper refuses to test Richard's food for poison, as he usually does, Richard says, Patience is stale, and I am weary of it, line 103, and acts. He beats the jailkeeper and resists his murderers. His final rise and fall are expressed in his last words, lines 111 to 112. Mount, mount, my soul, thy seat is up on high, whilst my gross flesh sinks downward here to die. In this final action, Richard has at last joined merit to right. His appropriate epitaph is spoken at line 113 by his murderer, Sir Pierce of Exton. As full of valor as of royal blood. Royal blood implies right. Valor implies merit. In dying, Richard has finally united the two and in this way redeemed his broken time. In Act 5, Scene 3, we see that Henry's rise through merit will be attended by difficulties because of his questionable right. Rebellions in the land, lines 140 to 141, and the apparently dissolute behavior of Henry's son and heir, lines 1 to 12, threaten the stability of Henry's rule. In the final scene, Act 5, Scene 6, at lines 49 to 50, Henry laments the death of Richard, acknowledging that he must now bear the guilt of both the deposing and the murder of the rightful king. I'll make a voyage to the Holy Land to wash this blood off from my guilty hand. The end of the play is thus a completion of the chiasmic structure. Richard falls by trusting to right without merit. Henry rises by trusting to merit with questionable right. At the end, Richard rises into merit and heaven, and Henry sinks into guilt and worry. From this time, England will not be at peace until right and merit are united again in one king temporarily in Henry V, and finally, for the purposes of Shakespeare's history plays, in Henry VII. Now here are seven key lines. Key line one. At Act One, Scene One, line 196, using the royal plural, Richard says, We were not born to sue, but to command. 
This encapsulates Richard's image of himself. Because he is born to command, he assumes that all his commands, however self-indulgent and harmful to England, are justified. Key line 2. J.V. Cunningham's dictum that in Shakespeare foreground is background, which I discussed in Session 5 of Chapter 7 in Series 1, is illustrated by John of Gaunt's important observation at Act 1, Scene 2, Lines 37-41. to 41. God's is the quarrel, for God's substitute, meaning the king, his deputy anointed in his sight, hath caused his, that is Gloucester's, death, the which, if wrongfully, let heaven revenge, for I may never lift an angry arm against his minister. Gloucester, Richard's uncle, was the younger brother of John of Gaunt and of York. Here, both the reinforcement of Richard's right to rule and the principle that forbids harming the rightful king are expressed by the father of the man who will later depose Richard and become king in his place. The tragedy lies in the fact that Henry's deposing of Richard, though forbidden, is needed. Key line three. At the point of death, characters in Shakespeare often speak true prophecy. This is the case with the eloquent prophecy of John of Gaunt at Act 2, Scene 1, lines 31 to 66. Gaunt predicts not only the fall of Richard, but the utter corruption of England, a result of Richard's disastrous government of right without merit, and his equally disastrous overthrow at the hands of merit without right. This tragic fall of England will be redeemed, as Shakespeare portrays its history, only after 85 years of civil strife ending with the death of Richard III and the accession of Henry VII. Key Line 4 as his subjects gradually turn their loyalties from Richard toward Henry, the virtuous Duke of York is caught in the dilemma. At Act 2, Scene 3, at lines 141 to 159, York is at a turning point. I have had feeling of my cousin's, that is Henry's, wrongs, and labored all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come, in braving arms, be his own carver and cut out his way to find out right with wrong, it may not be. And you that do abet him in this kind cherish rebellion and are rebels all. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known unto you, I do remain as neuter. York then invites Henry and his followers to repose in his castle for the night. It may be I will go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. Nor friends nor foes to me welcome you are. Lines 168 to 170. By the end of the play, York will accuse his own son, historically his wife's son, Omerl, of treason against Henry. The tide of events has carried York's loyalty from one king to another without harm to his own character. He is the last representative of the generation of virtue, innocent of participation in the corruption that engulfs England through the next three generations. Key line 5. Like the deathbed prophecy of Gaunt, the conversation in Act 2, Scene 4, lines 19 to 20, between a Welsh captain and the Earl of Salisbury, prophesies Richard's fall. I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the base earth from the firmament. The image will be echoed by Richard himself in Act 3, Scene 3, lines 178 to 179. Down, down I come like glistering Phaeton, wanting the manage of unruly jades. Jades is a demeaning term for horses, insulting to the horses of the sun. Richard fails to notice that not the horses, 
but Phaeton's pride was to blame for the disaster. I will just digress for a moment to be sure you know the myth behind the image. Phaeton, the son of the sun god, Apollo, in doubt about his father's identity, journeyed to the east where Apollo offered to fulfill any wish of Phaeton as proof of his paternity. Phaeton asked to drive the chariot of the sun for one day. The horses were too much for him and wildly went off course, first upward, scorching the sky in a swath that became the Milky Way, then downward, scorching the earth in a swath that became the Sahara Desert and turning the men of the region black. Zeus put an end to the disaster by killing Phaeton with a thunderbolt. The story is in Shakespeare's most often used source, Ovid's Metamorphoses, Book 1, Line 750, to Book 2, Line 339. Key Line 6 The metaphor of England as garden, first heard from John of Gaunt at Act 2, Scene 1, Line 42, is developed in Act 3, Scene 4, Lines 55 to 66, when the king's gardener says, Oh, what pity is it! that he had not so trimmed and dressed his land as we this garden. Had he done so, himself had borne the crown, which waste of idle hours hath quite thrown down. The word waste will reappear in Richard's final soliloquy in Act 5, Scene 5, Line 49, I wasted time, and now doth time waste me. Key line 7. The prophecy of the Bishop of Carlisle echoes that of John of Gaunt I discussed in key line 3. At Act 4, Scene 1, line 321, the Abbot of Westminster has called the deposing of Richard a woeful pageant. Carlisle responds at lines 322 to 323, The woes to come! The children yet unborn shall feel this day as sharp to them as thorn. The woe to come will be the eighty-five years of civil wars. Now, here are two notes to help you in your reading. Note 1. At Act 2, Scene 2, lines 120 to 122, most editors print the lines thus. I should to plashy too, line break, but time will not permit, all is uneven, line break, and everything is left at six and seven. This is in keeping with the general editorial principle of regularizing lines into pentameters, here at the cost of having to invent a half line and two empty feet. However, both the first quarto and the first folio print the three lines as two lines, thus, I should to plashy too, but time will not permit. Line break. All is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven. The editors miss Shakespeare's clever bit of witty prosody. The first line, I should to plashy too, but time will not permit, is intentionally six metrical feet, making a hexameter. And the second line, all is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven, is intentionally seven metrical feet, making a heptameter. This disordering of the normal pentameters embodies in the irregular lines the very disorder and confusion implied by the phrase at six and seven, or we might say at sixes and sevens, already long in use by Shakespeare's time. Note 2. This is a historical note related to the play. On February 8, 1601, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, led a band of supporters and malcontents into London in an attempted rebellion against Queen Elizabeth I. On the day before the uprising, there was an unusual performance of Richard II by Shakespeare's company, the Chamberlain's Men. The performance had been commissioned by Sir Jelly Merrick, a devoted supporter of Essex, in the hopes that seeing the play would influence the populace to support the rebellion. 
The Chamberlain's men objected that they would lose money since the play was so old that no one would likely show up. But they were offered forty shillings beyond their normal charge to perform a play, and so the play was performed. The rebellion of the next day failed, and both Essex and Merrick were executed by the end of the month. Augustine Phillips, a representative of the Chamberlain's men, had to give a deposition to explain why the company had agreed to perform that play about the deposing of a king on the day before a rebellion against the queen. The examiners were satisfied that the company had not been privy to the plot. The Queen's archivist, William Lambard, reports that reading about King Richard II in the archives and having in mind the Essex Rebellion, Elizabeth said, I am Richard, know ye not that? The day before Essex was executed, the Chamberlain's men performed Richard II before the Queen at Whitehall. I am Dr. Rapp, and this is Appreciating Shakespeare. Shakespeare.